Introducing our most advanced nutritional support, 3.0 Rise and 3.0 Restore by Longevity. This all-new two-part formulation builds upon almost 30 years of research and success of our legacy nutrition products. This is BTT 3.0, but with a new identity to highlight the inclusion of targeted support ingredients for an even more robust supplement. The new 3.0 Rise and Restore boosts health around the clock, using time duration nutrition for better absorption and utilization of each ingredient. This dual system goes beyond vitamins and minerals to provide targeted support for things important to all of us, like cognitive health, stress defense, mood wellness, and more. Designed to be taken specifically in the morning and evening, Rise and Restore gives you exactly what you need, when you need it, for maximum health benefits. Formulated with more whole foods and plant-based ingredients, this system is the most comprehensive nutritional support ever offered by Longevity. Rise is gluten-free and vegetarian-friendly and features nootropic cognitive support with energy and metabolism-boosting ingredients as well as mood-boosting components. It also provides phytonutrients for everyday antioxidant and immune support and cellular hydration support. Restore is also gluten-free and vegetarian-friendly designed with restorative nutrients to help your body recover from the day's stressors, featuring circulation and cardiovascular support, ashwagandha for relaxation and stress relief, detox support, pre- and probiotics for good gut health, as well as an adaptogenic blend for reducing stress, anxiety, and fatigue. Together, these innovative research-driven formulas provide a full-circle approach to daily foundational nutrition for an active life, all in great tasting new flavors that make this product an easy lifestyle addition you'll look forward to each day to help set the tone for productive days and restful nights. As research continues to identify opportunities to improve health, Longevity will be at the forefront of those discoveries. Our mission has always been to support your overall health. Now we're going even deeper to target and support your optimal health, wellness, and happiness. Welcome to a new era in longevity nutrition. Welcome, everybody. It is the top of the hour, at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I want to welcome everybody again. Thank you so much for coming. And we do this call every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we've been doing this since probably around 2011 is when I think our first order went in with um, the company. And so every time I tell you the same story, so there was one of our clients that was very interested in losing some weight, and we wanted him to win. We wanted him to be in the Healthy Body Challenge. We wanted him to, you know, be the rock star. And so we followed him, and we stayed with him, and we wanted him to be very successful. So... I, I want to welcome you, and um, this we must say every week is uh, legally that this meeting is for educational, entertainment, and education purposes only. So what you hear tonight is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure anyone or anything. And that being said, it takes great discipline to make changes in our mindset and habits and the things that we've been told over the years, whether you're 5, 10, 20, 40 or 50, we've all been told things in our lives and uh, believe that if you hear something here tonight that is not what you've been known to be true, if not been told, um, and then you're kind of wondering, or if you'd like to discuss that further, you can call us back and we can talk about it. Or else you can look at my website, and that's uh, Managing Restored. Dot com, M-A-N-A-G-I-N-G, R-E-S-T-O-R-E-D, dot com. And so we're here to seek true science-based, clinically proven use in nutrition. And a lot of times people do feel better within three days. Uh, three weeks is uh, you're really feeling a lot better. So if you take that little survey, and usually you can find that on the website with the company, or you can ask for it. I've usually sent it in an email or text. And there's a little self-evaluation questionnaire that I think everyone should just kind of do this for their own records just to 
maintain your own health um, self governance and you know it's it's something that when you go into the doctor's office, you walk in there with a great big list of your medications and your vitamins and minerals and, you know, the foods that you eat on a daily basis, and then they evaluate you and they tell you what they think. But you're with yourself more than they are, and you probably know if you have a certain food, you do the pulse test, and you're like, oh, my goodness, my pulse has, yes, increased or decreased within so many points then you know that you might have a intolerance or an allergy or, you know, you're having an effect from that certain food when you do the pulse test. And so the self-evaluation has four categories, which is pretty easy for anyone to decipher. One would be the hard tissue problems or soft tissue problems or blood sugar problems or digestion problems. So if you don't have that, little health self-evaluation questionnaire, you may call and request that. So tonight I picked up this book, you know, because Dr. Wallach always talks about energy, you know, and I think Dave's probably on the line. He can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's like 1882 when in New York somebody flipped the switch and we no longer used the wood ash from our wood stoves to cook with. And, I mean, to uh, put on our gardens, and they started using electricity. It's Monday, September 4th, 1882, 3 p.m. Uh, Henry, not Henry, <laughs> Thomas Edison flipped the switch on the first electric power plant in the world. And that was the beginning of Hell's Kitchen. That was when he wrote the book Hell's Kitchen? Well, no, I'm saying that was what created Hell's Kitchen. That was the beginning of Hell's Kitchen because we no longer cooked with wood uh, or heated our homes with wood, and then we stopped putting wood ash from our wood stoves and, and cook stoves on our gardens. And that's where we got our, you know, our minerals from. Most farms got their minerals that way. Other farms got it from you know, the the spring thaw when the snows would melt up in the mountains and bring down the crushed rock mineral and, and flood the bottomlands. And that all stopped because they built 3,000 dams. I think we got 3,000 dams or so in America. And the dams dam up the minerals and prevent them from going down the rivers and down into the bottomlands and out into the ocean and that's why the sharks are eating people because they're starving. The the coral reefs are dying because there's no minerals for the polyps to eat, and the coral eat the polyps. And anyway, yeah, it's a big deal. So, but we are Sorry, pretty grateful for uh, the fact that a lot of people did know that when they put their uh, wood ash on their trees, their gardens or whatever, that uh, the flavor was better, that, you know, the nutrition was better. It was like composting right in your own garden with your own, you know, like eggshells or anything like that. So I know that we go to this one maple syrup farm, and my gosh, they use the, the tree limbs from their maple trees to burn while they're making the syrup in their, you know, their building. And then they use those ashes to put back around the maple tree. And my goodness, you can taste, you taste the, the smoke, actually. I, I have tasted the smoke from the maple syrup because I've been there when they've been cooking the maple syrup. So it's a really fantastic thing. In the springtime, it's a really good thing to uh to witness that. So I want to read a little bit here from The Energy Crisis, uh, Dr. Wallach's book, Energy Crisis, Dr. J. W. Uh, D. J. <laughs> J. D. <laughs> I'm so excited. J. D. Wallach. Uh, he, he has a BS, a D, V, M, and an ND. And then Dr. Milan worked on this book with him, and she has an MD, an MS, and an LAC. So 
the acknowledgments here, the authors wish to acknowledge the contributions of several individuals without whom this book would have never reached publication. So we wish to recognize Steve Wallach, Dr. Gerhard Schrauser, and Martin for their research efforts and their ability to access pertinent data necessary for an accurate portrayal of the problems and solutions for a healthy and effective approach to supplemental energy. We must also add to our list contributions from NBA shot blocking champion Theo Ratliff, nationally ranked natural bodybuilding champion Gene Nelson, and holder of 35 world powerlifting championship records Fred Glass for their feedback on the effectiveness of different sports drinks and energy drinks. We must thank Marge Hatzinger, Char Murphy, and Mary Ann Gordon for reading and editing the manuscript of Energy Crisis. We also wish to acknowledge Steve Wallach, Vince Marisigian, and John Taylor for their contributions to the cover design. So Dr. Wallach has been involved in biomedical research and clinical medicine for over 49 years. And this book was written, uh, let me take a look over here, it's a publishing date, 2007. Copyright first edition was in 2007. So 49 years prior to 2007, okay? So he received his BS degree, Bachelor of Science in Agriculture, from the University of Missouri with a major in Animal Husbandry, Nutrition, and a minor in Field Crops and Soils, a DVM, a Veterinary Medicine, from the University of Missouri, three-year postdoctoral fellowship, Comparative Pathology Medicine, Washington University, St. Louis, Missouri, the Center for the Biology of Natural Systems, the St. Louis Zoological Gardens, Shaw's Botanical Gardens, Botany Department, Washington University, Iowa State University, State Diagnostic Laboratory, Ames, Iowa, Natal Parks Board, Umful Ozi, and Hula Nuzi Game Parks, Operation Rhino, Republic of South Africa, the Chicago Zoological Garden, Brookfield Zoo, Shedd Aquarium, Chicago, Illinois, Yerkes Regional Primate Research Center, Emory University, Atlanta, Georgia, ND, naturopathic physician, the National College of Naturopathic Medicine, Portland, Oregon, Harbin Medical University, Harbin Hiai, Longjing, and the Shanghai Medical University, People's Republic of China. So that's just a few things that... Um, Dr. Wallach has done with a member of the NIH site, visit teams for facilities using exotic animals models for the study of human disease for four years and was a member of the 1968 National Science Foundation Ad Hoc Committee that authored the Animal Welfare Act, Humane Housing, Nutrition and Care of Laboratory Exotic Species a professor of nutrition at the National College of Naturopathic Medicine, Portland, Oregon, a consulting professor of medicine, Harbin Medical University, Harbin He, Longjing, People's Republic of China, and was a primary care clinical practice for 12 years. So he's been... Um, also appearing in expert witness in state and federal courts as a comparative pathologist. Dr. Wallach attained the rank of lieutenant colonel in the Missouri Air National Guard, 131st Tactical Hospital, known as Lindbergh's Own, and the Alaska Air Reserves with responsibilities in public health and prevention and cleanup of nuclear, biological, and chemical accidents and attacks in North America and Europe. Dr. Wallach was a recipient of the Wooster Beach Gold Medal Award, Association of Eclectic Physicians, for a significant breakthrough in the basic understanding of the cause in pathophysiology patho of cystic fibrosis. Dr. Wallach was nominated for 1991 Nobel Prize in Medicine, Association of Eclectic Physicians, for his work in the understanding of the Genesis and Pathophysiology of Cystic Fibrosis. Dr. Wallach received the 2004 Guardian of the Constitution Award, 
Emmerd and Associates for his proactive and successful litigation efforts in obtaining nutrition claims from the FDA for selenium and omega-3 essential fatty acids. He also received the 2004 James Lind Scientific Achievement Award, Emmerd and Associates, for brilliant discoveries that have paved the way for greater health and longevity for Americans. Dr. Wallach has appeared frequently on local and nutritional networks, remember this is from 2007, and public radio and television, including a special on cystic fibrosis with ABC's 2020 regional and national talk radio programs as an expert on trace mineral and rare earth deficiency diseases. Dr. Wallach is the host of his own syndicated talk radio show programs, Let's Play Doctor, Dead Doctors Don't Lie, because of his freewheeling style of humor and ability to zero in on the basic truth in health problems and medical politics. He is widely known as the Rush Limbaugh of alternative health. Dr. Wallach has given an average of 300 free lectures per year for more than 15 years, literally reaching millions of Enthusiastic fans, his tape, Dead Doctors Don't Lie, translated into eight languages, has more than 70 million copies in circulation worldwide. Dr. Wallach has also co-authored eight best-selling health books with Dr. Milan. He has more than 75 peer review publications to his credit, including a major reference, The Disease of Exotic Animals, published by W.B. Saunders. This 1,000-page illustrated text is listed by the Smithsonian Institute as a recommended reference for all professional zoological parks and aquariums. And it goes on to um, discuss Dr. Milan's, uh, her education in the People's Republic of China. Dr. Milan received her MD from the Beijing Medical University, took her residency at the People's Hospital, Beijing, and was a staff surgeon at the Canton Air Force Hospital. Dr. Milan received her MS, Master of Science, and Transplantation Immunology from Zhongsheng Medical University, Canton People's Republic of China. As with the Chinese doctors, Dr. Milan was trained in traditional Chinese medicine. Those include acupuncture, herbs, manipulation, food as medicine, massage, and hydrotherapy prior to entering the Western-style medical schools. Dr. Milan's research credits include being an exchange scholar at Harvard School of Medicine, research fellow in laser microsurgery, Boston MA, a research fellow in laser microsurgery at the St. Joseph Hospital, Houston, Texas, the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, the Medical College of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and the Department of Pharmacology, Pharmacology, uh, University of California. San, San Diego, California, Dr. Milan has practiced as an acupuncturist for 20 years. This is since 2007, this was written, so I just want to remind you. Dr. Milan has 10 peer review publications to her credit in the fields of transplant immunology and laser vascular microsurgery. Dr. Milan attained the rank of lieutenant in the Chinese Air Force with primary responsibilities as a general surgeon in the Canton Air Force Hospital, People's Republic of China. So, yes, there is an energy crisis. And uh, the world supply of fossil fuels, oil, and coal is shrinking. People and governments are turning to alternative fuels, hydroelectric, nuclear, ethanol from corn, windmills, solar, power, etc. However, the real energy crisis is found in humans. The crisis is the lack of mental and physical energy for their family in the world's human population. And so we can look back in dictionaries, and they actually referred to a human as a monster. So as we learn these things, we want to correct them. And so that's pretty much what we want to do. Humans are literally starved for energy. They crave energy, they need energy, and they know they must have more energy to function in their trade or profession and to participate in life itself. Humans have sought out and used herbs of various types as stimulants and energy 
or qi, qi, for thousands of years. The presentation, the Japanese tea ceremony, and the marketing of energy supplements, celebrity endorsements, have become very high. Tech and these activities have reached a fever pitch. Everybody wants energy. Every 5%, I'm sorry, 85% of all people visiting their family doctor complain of low energy, chronic fatigue, and an inability to keep up with the pace of modern life. So in the 1980s, lattes and cappuccinos were primary, primarily the fare of sidewalk cafes and trendy coffee houses in the larger cities. In the late 20th century and then early 21st centuries, these exotic Energy drinks have taken root in the fast food community. Starbucks, McDonald's, Jack in the Box, Dunkin' Donuts, trendy hangouts of exotic coffee lovers. But uh, now here we have Red Bull, Monster, Rockstar, Act, our hybrid carbonated energy drinks that combine the chemistry of herbs, vitamins, amino acids, and fruit extracts to drive individual energy levels to super performance peaks. Because of the worldwide shift from soft drinks to energy drinks as the drinks of choice, we believe that the information in energy crisis is timely. So that's that's, uh, the introduction. Chapter 1 starts off with um, a quote here from Antoine Lavoisier uh, from 1743. his time was 1743 to 1794. Respiration is merely a slow combustion of carbon and hydrogen, which is similar in every respect to that which occurs in a lighted candle. And from this point of view, animals and humans that breathe are really combustible bodies which produce energy and burn and are consumed. So life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. That's from Albert Einstein. So why I wanted to pick this book today is because I saw here, I just kind of glanced here, and there's a lot of sports events that, you know, we're excited. You know, we have tennis and baseball and football and hockey and, you know, the greatest, you know, many, many sports, okay, and a lot of these young athletes are having injuries very early, and I believe because of these carbonated drinks, they do cause problems in people um, with their health, okay, so um, soft drinks, here's, um, they were developed originally as refreshing patent medicines, patented medicines. In 1876, Charles Hires, H-I-R-E-S, sold his Hires root beer at the Great Centennial Exposition. It contains 16 roots and herbs, including birch bark, spikenard, sarsaparilla, and hops. He had sold his drink for seven years at his Philadelphia pharmacy after creating it on his honeymoon in 1870. In 1877, Hires sold his root beer by mail order, a 25-cent packet that made five gallons. In 1880, Ira Remsen published an article describing his accidental discovery of saccharin, a synthesized chemical substance that he said was 300 times sweeter than an equal amount of sugar. Saccharin was a white, crystalline, aromatic compound that had no nutritive value as it passed through the body unchanged. At the time of his discovery, Remsen felt that saccharin would have great commercial value because it could prove quite useful for diabetes, for fat people and others that could not use sugar. In 1885, a new tonic brain food and accelerant, Dr. Pepper, went on sale at Wade Morrison's Old Corner Drug Store. Morrison moved to Waco, Texas from Virginia after his courtship with Miss Pepper was ended by her father, 
who also happened to be his boss. Morrison headed west and bought the pharmacy where a clerk named Charles Elderton and Morrison concocted a new drink. Morrison named it after Miss Pepper's father, Dr. Pepper. Ingredients were carbonated water, high fructose corn syrup, caramel color, phosphoric acid, natural and artificial flavors, sodium benzoate, a preservative, and caffeine. So that's a little history on soft drinks. Um, the next chapter talks about uh, Coca-Cola with uh, 1886 John Stythe Pemberton, a Civil War veteran and local Atlanta, Georgia pharmacist invented Coca-Cola, which he sold for five cents per glass. Sufferers of all kinds found consolation in the new uh, cocoa extract brew. It was billed as the intellectual beverage and temperance drink. Coca-Cola was said to cure dyspepsia, indigestion, and headaches. Pemberton claimed that it lifted the spirits as well. The Atlanta pharmacist formed the Pemberton Chemical Company and registered a trademark for French wine and cocoa an ideal nerve tonic and stimulant. To attract the teetotalers, he took out the alcohol and added caffeine-rich cola nut extract. That's where that little rhyme came in. Who put the lime in the coconut? Okay, no, anyways. (laughs) Uh, Coca-Cola competed with other drinks, including Imperial Inca Cola, Coca Coffee, and Coca Fiend. The original coca drink, Vin Marini, had won prizes from organizations all over Europe, one of which was called it a wine for athletes. Experts of the day said that cocaine can cure everything, from head colds to mental depression that accompanies the hysteria, uh, PMS, in the female to lack of energy. Pemberton also created Globe of Flower Cough Syrup, Indian Queen Hair Dye, and Triple X Liver Pills. Pemberton joined forces with entrepreneur Asa Chandler, who immediately saw a wider commercial value of the drink Coca-Cola and turned the local curiosity into a serious business. The average sales of the original product per pharmacy immediately reached nine bottles per day. In 1889, Chandler attributed mythical properties to Coca-Cola and began to advertise it as a sovereign remedy. Many scientists of the day disagreed. By 1890, 400 chemical, uh, clinical, I'm sorry, 400 clinical cases of acute suffering from cocaine abuse had been reported in medical journals. Physician Albrecht Erlenmeyer called the drug the third scourge on mankind, after morphine and alcohol. Park Davis sells cocaine in cigarettes, ointments, tablets, and injections. Whoa, that's quite a little story in that paragraph, the third little paragraph there on page uh, 130. Uh, Here we go in the middle of the book here, um, in this page. Angelo Mariani, whose Vin Mariani was the drug's first commercial application, collected a list of well-known users, including Thomas Edison, Sigmund Freud, and Pope Leo XIII, who was said to keep a flask of Vin Mariani under his belt. In 1894, Joseph Bidenhorn, Bidenhorn was the first individual to market Coca-Cola in a bottle. In 1898, Caleb Bradham, a New Borough, North Carolina pharmacist, prompted by the success of Coca-Cola, created a similar carbonated drink. Originally, the new fountain beverage was called Brad's Drink, but later the name was changed to Pepsi-Cola and bottled to widen the sales base. In 1899, two lawyers, Benjamin E. Thomas and Joseph Witt, Head, Whitehead, I'm sorry, uh, secured exclusive rights to bottle and sell Coca-Cola for $1. By 1900, Coca-Cola served two bottles a day. In 1916, the root glass 
Company of Terre Haute, Indiana, created the famous Coca-Cola female body-shaped bottle. The motto, motto was, you can identify Coca-Cola even in the dark. By 1920, Coca-Cola was serving 1,000 bottles a day. In 1923, Robert Woodruff, five years after his father purchased the Coca-Cola company, began to distribute the drink worldwide. By 1925, Coca-Cola sales were generating $6 million per day in sales. In 1925, that's a lot of dough, isn't it? In 1928, Coca-Cola ads followed the American Olympic team to the Amsterdam Olympics. Coca-Cola ads were emblazoned on racing dog sleds in Canada. The bullfighting arenas in Spain, Coca-Cola introduced the six-pack and the open-topped cooler concept. Okay, so some of these that I'm going to read now, you guys are going to probably be more familiar with because those are probably before a lot of our time. But here in 1941, Coca-Cola Woodruff ordered Every man in uniform gets a bottle of Coke for five cents, wherever he is and whatever it costs the company. 1943, General Dwight D. Eisenhower sent an urgent cablegram to Coca-Cola requesting the shipment of enough materials to build 10 bottling plants between 1941 and 1960. The number of countries bottling Coca-Cola doubled. What's in that stuff? After 75 years, Coca-Cola began to introduce additional flavors to the original product line. By 1966, the international sales grew in many countries, including Cambodia, Montserrat, Paraguay, Meku, and Turkey. In 1978, Coca-Cola Company secured the sole rights to market packaged cold drinks in the People's Republic of China. In 1981, Robert E. Guzetta became chairman of the board and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company and installed a new policy he called Intelligent (laughs) Risk-Taking. Installed a new policy he called Intelligent Risk-Taking. I think right now, lead us not into temptation. So in 1985, Coca-Cola became the first soft drink in space. Diet Coke was introduced, and Guazetta tried to introduce a sugar substitute sweetened drink to replace the original sugared Coca-Cola in a move that critics called the biggest marketing blunder ever, overwhelmed by enormous customer pressure, including... Class action lawsuits. The original sugar sweetened formula was returned to the marketplace as Coca Cola Classic. 1995, the USDA reported that Americans consume one half pound of sugar per day, up to one half pound of sugar per year, 100 years earlier. According to the USDA, this unbelievable rate of sugar consumption is driven by a horde of sugared carbonate, I'm sorry carbohydrate, foods, snacks, and drinks. In 2004, the worldwide Coca-Cola sales reached $1.3 billion per day. The same year, the Harvard Nurses Health Study reviewed the health records of 91,000 nurses over the age of 35 for an eight year period and determined that nurses drinking one sugar-sweetened soft drink per day had an 85% increased risk of developing adult-onset type 2 diabetes diabetes over those nurses who didn't drink it. Ingredients are carbonated water, high fructose corn syrup, caramel color, phosphoric acid, natural flavors, and caffeine. Should I go on? They talk about 7-Up in October of 1929. This was Charles Leeper Grigg of the Howdy Corporation invented bib label 
associated lemon lime soda. The name was changed in 1936 to 7-Up. It is theorized that the name 7-Up came from Mr. Griggs' favorite card game, 7-Up. 7-Up originally contained lithium, an essential trace mineral that is used medically to treat depression. 7-Up sales were driven to success by the Great Depression and the speakeasies as a mixer for their drinks. By the 1930s, 7-Up had become one of America's most popular drinks, and by the end of World War II, 7-Up was the third leading soft drink in America. That sounds to me like they were, um, okay, Uh, I'm going to keep on reading. I'm not going to interject my thoughts here. Uh, The lithium was removed from the formula approximately in 1950. In 1963, 7-Up released a drink called Like as a diet lemon-lime drink. Seven years later, it was reformulated and renamed Diet 7-Up. In 1988, the Dr. Pepper Company merged with the 7-Up. In 1995, the Dr. Pepper uh, and 7-Up Company was bought by Cadbury Schweppes. Ingredients, carbonated water high fructose corn syrup, citric acid, natural flavors, and natural potassium citrate. So on page 133, it talks about soft drinks, hazards, obesity, diabetes, fractures, and behavior problems. Kind of where I started in the beginning of this um, uh, conversation here tonight, the fact that there's so many young athletes, whatever the sport is, they're having fractures breaks and and these all of these things can be remedied okay they can be avoided and we can help support the body so they don't have fractures they don't have obesity and diabetes and behavior problems because the things that we just spoke about the sugar high fructose corn syrup carbonation all these things um Lithium, coca, cola, um, cocaine, different things. They're, some are natural. Some are not natural. Some, these things, we have to investigate them, and that's where we're very grateful and thankful that Dr. Wallach and Dr. Milan and his whole research team and all the other people that do the research and work on these different books that he's written, we're grateful for so if you want to know more about them, you can get them at www.drjwallet.com and, and get these, gift these to your friends and family for Christmas or, you know, whatever holidays or birthdays or if somebody's uh, graduating or going to get married. It's very important that they know this information so they can take care of themselves and avoid going to doctors and hospitals and having surgeries that we can't undo. And it's a lot of undoing of experimentation that many of us in the world have suffered from for too long. So in 1995, the USDA reported that Americans consumed one half pound of sugar per day, up from one half pound of sugar per person per year 100 years earlier. According to the USDA, this unbelievable rate of sugar consumption is driven by a horde of carbohydrate and sugar-packed junk foods, snacks, and beverages. So I want to remind you, everybody, Thursday's Halloween. Listen to what I'm saying about this stuff and be mindful of what you're going to give the children. I'd give them a quarter or a nickel or, you know, a dime or, or a dollar, okay, instead of candy. I'd give them a pen or a pencil or an eraser to erase all the damage that's been done. So, okay, next uh, paragraph. Experts blame this increased rate of sugar consumption for the increased rate of diagnosis of childhood ADD, ADHD, and autism, despite an increased rate of prescribed drugs and increased employment of behavioral modification. In an attempt to break this cycle of sugar consumption and the genesis of behavioral and emotional diseases, many school districts throughout America have taken 
soft drinks, and other sugar-laden drinks out of the school lunches and school vending machines. Thank God for that stuff. They took them out. In 2004, worldwide Coca-Cola sales reached $2 billion per day. The same year, the Harvard Nurses Health Study reviewed the health records of 91,000 nurses over the age of 35 years for that eight-year period and determined that nurses drinking one sugar-sweetened soft drink per day had an 85% increase in developing adult-onset type 2 diabetes over the other nurses that did not consume that. So currently 75% of Americans are overweight and 40% are obese. 20% of kids under the age of 12 years old are obese. Health experts believe that these catastrophic statistics are caused by calories derived from the consumption of soft drinks. People, you are not sick. You're not overeating. You're deprived of what you really need. And sugar is causing people to be catastrophically obese and causing diabetes and other horrible diseases. Diet soft drinks were thought by many scientists to be a safer alternative to the sugar-sweetened soft drinks. However, a soft drink study by Boston University drew a different conclusion. The study published in the July 23, 2007 issue of the journal Circulation revealed that people who drank more than one diet soda each day developed the same risks for heart disease as those who drank the sugar-sweetened sodas. Hmm. The data was generated in a massive multi-generational health study. The new study of 9,000 observations of middle-aged men and women found that those who drank more than one soda per day, diet or regular, had an increased risk of acquiring the metabolic syndrome compared to those who drink less than one soda per day. Okay, so Dr. Wallach just came out with a brand new book about metabolic uh, syndrome. So originally referred to as Syndrome X is a cluster of symptoms that indicate an increased risk for heart disease, including abdominal obesity, hypertension, elevated blood cholesterol, and triglyceride levels and insulin resistance. And I've read books on each, almost each and every one of those topics separately. So there's a lot of research to be done for someone to put books together like this and, and, and teach us what they are putting a Band-Aid on in the doctor's offices because of the un truths or uneducation, the lies that we've been told to sell a product. So those drinking, I'm going to go to the last paragraph on this page, 134. Those drinking one diet soft drink per day had a 48% in risk for developing the metabolic syndrome and a 44% increase in risk of cardiovascular disease compared to those individuals who drank less. In June 15, 2000, Harvard Medical School released a study on fractures in 460 physically active 9th and 10th grade girls comparing the fractures rate in those girls who drank soft drinks against the fracture rate of those who didn't drink any soft drinks. Hmm, that's interesting. The study published in the Archives of Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine showed that almost 80% said they drank soft drinks. 50% drank colas. Only 11.5% drank only non-colas, and 15% drank both cola and non-cola sodas. Those who drank soft drinks were 300% more likely to have a fracture than those who didn't. This is why I wanted to tell you about athletes, okay? We just had one of our, uh, you know, the Lions. The Lions are really doing great this year, and one of the guys went down, and, you know, 
when someone goes down that, you know, is very, very, um, uh, I don't know, we're all important, okay? Everybody has their own um, talents on every team, okay? And so when someone goes down, that makes everybody else have to pick up the slack, okay? And we've seen that happen here. Um, we've seen it happen at work. We've seen it happen in school with teachers, um, doctors, offices, hospitals, EMS, on the farms, delivery, everywhere, okay? When someone doesn't show up, it affects everybody. So whether it's um, intestinal problems, if it's your um, digestive system, if it's blood sugar problems, what we're talking about here, causing fractures, breaks, obesity, uh, hard of breathing, you know, that has soft tissue issues, or hard tissue, that's the breaks. And um, so that's why I want to talk about these things tonight. Uh, to just wrap up this paragraph here, Dr. Grace Wyshak, lead investigator of the Harvard study, believes that the Phosphoric acid in soft drinks is the culprit that increases the risk of fractures in soft drink consumers. Phosphoric acid. An elevated dietary phosphoric intake significantly increases the individual's dietary requirements for calcium. So if you are consuming, this is what I got out of this paragraph here, if you're consuming Anything that has phosphoric acid, so you've got to read the labels, that's going to increase your risk of fractures, okay, because your body now has been, like, inhibited from the real calcium that your body requires. And what happens when, just from what I've learned, and if anybody's on the call that can correct me if I'm wrong, if the body is getting the wrong type of calcium, okay, phosphoric acid, whatever, and it's decreasing the ability to absorb properly, your body's going to grab calcium wherever they can grab it, wherever the body is smart. The, the, the body is beautiful. God made this body. You know, he didn't make a mistake. If we are consuming something robbing us, stealing from our body, the body is going to eat itself. And that's where, this is disgusting, but it's going to start drawing from your bones, drawing the calcium it needs from the bone that it has, okay? It's like a baby getting breast milk from the mother. The mother supplies the baby for a short time. So... Our body will grab from its own body the calcium from the bone, the marrow, the teeth, okay, the fingernails. And you can see your own body and you're in touch with your own body. You know that something's wrong. You're crickly and cracking. What's going on here? You're probably taking in something that's affecting your body and you just didn't know it. So if you cut out those foods that are affecting your body in a negative way, making your body have spots on it. You're hearing cra snap, crackle, pop, okay? Try laying off the pop for a while and see if that, um, you know, makes a difference. In the meantime, you can add bone broth, okay? You can throw in any beef, chicken, fish, whatever kind of, you know, whatever type of, meat, bone, and cook it down into a broth and drink that. Add some apple cider vinegar, you know, the real stuff, and check the labels. Read the labels. Make sure the mother is in it. And uh, make sure that the company wasn't sold to somebody else that's changing the ingredients. That's going to be your first clue. It used to be Monsanto. Now it's called Bayer, Okay. People change the names of companies to protect, you know, or to... If I may. Yes, David. Thank you. I needed a break. <laughs> so you just mentioned apple cider vinegar with the mother. So, you know, uh, Patricia Bragg, 
whose father started the Bragg's Apple Cider Vinegar Company, um, you know, they used to make it themselves, and then, you know, they grew and grew, and then they couldn't do it themselves, so they had a company making it for them. Well, Patricia Bragg retired some years back, and she sold the company to her neighbor, um, Taylor Swift, I think is her name. She's some kind of a singer, and she's not... uh, She's she's on the left leaning side of the world, and um, she teamed up with Bill Gates, and that Bragg's apple cider vinegar now has the A peel apples, and it's it's horrific. Um, my friend just found out about that. This happened several years back. Most of us found out about it a year or so ago. Uh, but he did some he's a deep diver research guy, and he found out that the company that was producing the apple cider vinegar for the Bragg's company is still producing it, and they are an organic uh, company, and um, and he found it. It's Fairchild. Foods, if you look up Fairchild, it pops right up. Uh, He said it's the first search. Um, And I mentioned it on a call today, and the guy who ran the call looked it right up, and he found them. And uh, it's like $10 and something cents for a 32-ounce quart bottle of organic apple cider vinegar raw with the mother. Um, you can also buy it in, you know, I think a two-pack, three, four, six packs, you know, a case of it, whatever. And uh, it, it's still raw with the mother, and they only use organic apples from Washington State. And um, so, yeah, everybody uh, look that up. Don't buy Bragg's apple cider vinegar anymore because it's not what it used to be, and I use Thank you. Wow, Dave. Yeah, I looked that up, and uh, they deliver. There's some good stuff there. Okay, so, and and that's what you're going to find out here on this call. Um, every week you have no idea what we're going to talk about. Uh, we did have some really great uh, little testimonials last week. Uh, we had our assembly people and they shared with us about the uh, huge crop they got this year after 35 years of uh, having a garden. This year they had an exceptional crop. So you can look at that um, in the archives. And let's see, one more thing here. I I appreciate you saying that, Dave, because um, I remember last year the, um, what was that, what was that football Super Bowl? At the Super Bowl that they had last year, and it was just a, it was a symbolic, uh, you know, sexual type of thing. If people, there's a lot of people that like that, and if they're putting cocaine and, you know, coke and lithium and all these different things in in these sodas and and passing on from one to another to another to lull the people to sleep, lithium, it's used for more than just um, lulling people to sleep. Right, they use it in batteries and and you know mix it with other things and cause a lot of problems. So um, I just wanted to say that there are alternatives. Okay, so instead of those soft drinks, pops and stuff like that, there's exotic juices and um, you know the value of fruit, real fruit, is uh, something that we should not ignore. The primary value of the exotic juices is twofold. I'm reading here on page 135. The first is a source of sugar and carbohydrates as a source of fuel for energy. And the second includes the value of organic phytonutrients such as vitamins and antioxidants. A good measure of the antioxidant value of an exotic juice is its ORAC score. O-R-A-C is an acronym for oxygen, reactive, Absorption capacity. I'll say it again. 
oxygen, reactive, absorption, capacity. In fact, it is a direct measurement of how many free radicals can be neutralized or scavenged by a particular substance. We've been talking about auric points for how many years? <laughs> it's just been a long, long time. So there's a little chart here on the next page with the juices that we have, not we, actually, it's the company that we, you know, we enjoy using their product. It's Oric Value in ounces, okay? So the Noni juice is 398 Oric Value in an ounce. Noni Goose juice it has 398. The Noni Plus Plus has 398. The Mangustine juice has 498, and the Wolfberry juice has 363. Mangostine, yeah, juice is 498. Exotic juice blends are ORAC value in ounces. The EQ factor has 1,800. Vitali, 2,238, and Cocojevity, 3,000. And they don't have the Cocojevity anymore. So we really do need to, uh, you know, write. If there's something that you like, okay, a lot of us were raised to be seen and not heard. Well, I'm saying when I heard David tell me, because I don't watch a lot of TV, i you know, busy. David listens to news 24-7. And Dave, tell us what the president said about it's not handing it over from one party to another. And this is important to understand this. We have to be able to speak up as people or we lose our ability to speak up. Okay. So when President Trump was uh, inaugurated in 2016 or 2017, um, his uh, in his inaugural speech, he said, "This is not the normal transition from one party to another. It's Washington D.C. handing the power back to the people." What's the first three words of the Constitution? We the people. And what's Washington D.C.? We the D. people. C. Washington D.C. is the District of Criminals. Well, Columbia. It's, it's Columbia. the District of Columbia. Columbia is a is a, um, a what is the word I said earlier today? Columbia is not well. Not I mean it is de facto, but it's it's demonic. It's uh, a pagan goddess that they have on top of. It's a statue on top of the Capitol. The, the goddess Columbia. I mean, why? What? That's the name of our capital of our United States. I've Is never been there, never seen it. So. Washington D.C. District of Columbia. Why would our capital be a district of a pagan goddess? I mean, what does that tell you, folks? You know. Now, I was talking earlier uh, on a we're on a committee uh, in our assembly and we were talking about this that you know we the people are supposed to be the government government means govern means control and meant is mind so it, government is mind control so we are supposed to be self-governing that means we're supposed to control our own mind and our public servants, our elected, you know, workers, they, they work for us. They're our maids and butlers, basically, doing, you know, these menial tasks that, you know, they, they've, they've turned into this, you know, behemoth. Uh, People have where been speaking they're, up and asking them to do anything for them. People have said, they've taken we can't over do anything about it. 
We're supposed to be leading ourselves. We're supposed to be governing ourselves. And they, they, because we fell asleep as a people, as we the people, and we let them do everything for us, they became, you know, this became a nanny state. And they've, you know, from cradle to grave, they, they want to control everything we do and say and, and eat and drink. And they want to... They do not want us using the nutritional supplements that Doc, you know, Doc's research has proven. It's irrefutable evidence that this is the raw materials, the building blocks of life. What the body needs to, to you know, needs in order to do what it was designed divinely to do, heal itself. They do not want us healing ourselves or self-governing. Because, because there's no money in it. That's they right. want no commission. to control everything we do, and they want our lives from cradle to grave to be very short. And so how many, poor experiments, and how many experiments are we going to allow them to do on us? Okay, I have this stomach problem. Well, what did you eat last night? I mean, that's the conversation. We in our groups, we have conversations like this. And can you make a, a little list of the foods that you've been eating? Can you do a pulse test? Can you do this hair analysis? All of the information is here for you to do it yourself. If you want to go and get taken care of because you're not getting enough attention, I'm not saying everybody, okay? Not saying everybody, but some people really don't know where their pain is coming from. A lot of pain is emotional pain. A lot wait, of a pain minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. A lot of pain wait is... All disease because... starts in the gut. Emotional pain comes from the gut. It's because our, when our gut... What, that mean, what does that mean, all disease starts in the gut? Well, the gut is a pristine bag of acid, okay? The, bag, the acid in our stomach prevents anything from getting in our body that's supposed to be there. God designed it that way. So the acid in our stomach is when we use salt, salt is an essential nutrient. Why did Christ say go out and be the salt of the earth? Because salt is essential, and so are we to each other. So if we don't put salt in our body to make our stomach acid hydrochloric acid, we can't, we die without salt. Literally, we will die without salt. So that's why salt is so prevalent on this planet. God was very smart. He gave us everything we needed, you know, and, and it's all there. So we got to find it, right? Well, we, it's hard. We all can't go mining, you know, for minerals and salt and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, there's, there's companies or people that do that. And uh, Doc was fortunate enough to, to figure this out. When he went to college, his, his professor was the, the mineral man. And it, he turned Doc into the mineral man. Um, anyway, uh, you know, not to go off on a tangent here. So we, we, when we eat, we have to salt our food to taste. And if if our stomach acid is weak, then we don't break down our food. Everything the the stomach turns into a brewery. Okay, and it's dark and wet and and moist and warm and stuff starts to grow in there that's not supposed to be growing in there now stuff enters the body that should have been if if you know we eat something that we shouldn't have eaten that you know might be you know bad for us and i don't mean one of the bad foods i mean you know maybe a parasite or something like that uh the the stomach acid will kill it if the stomach acid is the way it's supposed to be 1.2 1.2 on that alkaline scale, okay? When there's certain foods we eat that will neutralize our stomach acid and prevent us from breaking down the food and boiling everything to sanitary, to uh, sanitize it before it comes into the small intestine. Um, when, it, when it's weak stomach acid, then the, you know, the, the, the small intestine becomes compromised it, the villi die back, uh, the exposing the the intestinal lining, creating little pinholes, and now whole molecules of food go in through these pinholes and cause you know uh, 
not uh, not irrevocable damage. It can be repaired if it's not gone too far. But we don't know where that point is. So there is a point of no return. Uh, The doctors don't know where it is. But they tell you as soon as they see you with a blood test, oh, my goodness, you have this and you're going to die in this amount of time. And most people go home and they, they follow orders and they die because they listen to those idiot doctors who don't know anything. They know nothing about nutrition. They know nothing about the body. All they know is drugs and surgery. And we, we don't use drugs and surgery. And they don't like us for it. And I'll yield there. Thank you. Whoa. And that's a wrap. Boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. And if you go to a restaurant and they offer you your food in a wrap, just don't take the wrap, okay? You're not a wrap star. You don't need the wrap. You just take the lettuce and the meat and all the good stuff and make yourself a nice little meal there, and they'll do it for you. So uh, and if you want, take that wrap and give it to somebody else, okay? Because until we teach everybody about what they've done to the barley, the rye, the oats, and the wheat, and the buckwheat, and the sweets, and the sugars, and all of that in the, in the field, we're still going to have to keep on educating. We're still going to have to read labels, okay? And we appreciate you coming to the calls every week. And I know it was uh, an hour. You probably want to hear more. But um, right now we got to get on another call. And um, if you want to send this to someone, replay this. All you have to do is dial 717-908-1836 and then put in your participant code 900774-POUNDS. And you can re-listen to this. You can send it to somebody. 717 is the number. 908-1836 is the replay number. And then you put in the participant access code 900774-POUNDS Thank you all for coming. Have a great night and a better tomorrow. We'll see you next week. Bye now.